Welcome back to my part 6 of the series of talks from Art to Science in Search of Reality. I'm Marcello Costa. I am a retired Emeritus Professor of Flinders University. Well, in part 6, Painting Beyond Visual Reality, I think it's saying that painting reaches the limit of visual representation. I mentioned that it opens the postmodernity with the end of painting, an idea proposed by Robert Hughes in his book The Shock of the New, Art and the Century of Change. And I told you that visual art is ready to address the inner space of the mind. Indeed, in this part 7, I'm going to deal with the way in which the brain constructs visual experiences and suggest that painting in the 20th century is really a search of how the brain constructs visual experiences. Go back to Descartes. He was the first one to reflect on himself and introduce the idea that the mind engages with the world through intervening representation constructed by the senses, vision, and then eventually it reaches the, the, the brain and the sense of self expand on this idea to propose that the self-recognition rely upon mental representation of the self. For the cast, self-awareness was localized to a discrete anatomical structure, the pineal gland, from which it was transformed again into physics with the contraction of the muscles. So you can see he started the idea of a mechanistic relation between experience and behavior to the mind, but he left open the idea that there was still something mysterious in between them. But really, the first modern idea that we are aware that the observer plays an important role was really the painter René Magritte, who painted with an awareness of being an observer, an observer who paints what perceives but does not confuse it with the real thing. This painting of a pipe, he says, Ceci n'est pas un pipe. This is not a pipe. He called this the treason of images. Because people say, but this of course is a pipe. No, he said, no, this is a painting of a pipe. Just like this is the human condition. What you see across the window is like a representation of what you see across the window. It's like a paint of painting what you see. It's a process of seeing it's not the same thing as the object you see. So this is the, really the importance of the painters in making us realize that the brain takes a very active role in what actually we experience. <coughs> now, the major features of visual system is to extract from the external worlds where things are, location and space, what things are, both shapes and colors, who is there, faces, are they human or animals, and what are they doing, sense of motion. Let's take one at a time. Where things are, location and space. Well, I described to you the development of space and perspective, plus we also have what is called stereopsis, a 3D sensation. I will not spend any time in it, it's part of the physiology of the brain and, and vision, which I taught for many years, but this is a little summary of how we develop a depth of perception. The monocular cues with just one eye is what the painters did. Of course, we know that if you move your head, you can tell where things are in space. And if you don't move your head and look with just one eye, like all the painters, you have the pictorial cues that we went through it. With the development and invention of a linear perspective in the Renaissance, then the ability of controlling color, atmospheric perspective with impressionism, texture gradient, elevation orientation, shade occlusion of objects to give a sense of what is in front and what is behind, the relative size. We went through this in the development, indeed, of modern painting. But then we have other cues that come from having two eyes, which means that we see the world with two different cameras, like I will ignore for the time being the convergence, and uh, the stereopsis or sense of 3D come from the very fact that the brain 
sees the object assigned with two eyes, two pictures which are different, and they are they're not the same. They have a binocular disparity. And it's the disparity itself <laughs> that is sufficient for the brain to build the sense of 3D, even of things that are not really visually detectable. I will not spend any time, but this is part, if like, of physiology of vision. It has not much to do with painting. But the pictorial cues, I went through it in great detail already. Let's see what is the brain doing of establishing what things are there. Shapes. Well, that's very important. I told you that the shapes started a long time ago. In early in evolution, humans produced many proto-mathematical or geometrical objects with regular shapes based on symmetry and geometry, as evidenced by this bifacial spheroid date back 1.6 million years ago. The complex combination of this form became evident as early as 17,000 years ago, as illustrated by the engraved pattern in this oak artifact, of this picture here with geometry in, indeed. I took you through already the shape of the original painting in the caves, in the Chauvet cave, for instance, a very absurd sign as an abandoned and outline of animal appear early in the caves. You can see this represent initial drawings of outline of the animals themselves. So outlining was the very first thing to establish what is there. The outlining remained for a long time. Indeed, this uh, in the book of Middle Ages before the realistic painting, they still use preferentially outlines with very sharp black and white line outlining the persons. So this was retained from the very uh, cave paintings. But let's see in modern times. Piet Mondrian, a very modern painting in the early 1900s, a very famous, beautiful painting, realistic one in a way, not quite abstract, the evening red tree. We follow his changes of the style of painting trees in this next slide, used by other people as well, but I created this myself, the original painting, 908. A few years later, he became slightly more abstract, probably the same tree, uh, inverted, in more abstract yet again, and finally, in 1915, just vertical, horizontal lines. It's as he increases the abstraction of his original uh, uh, tree painting, as if he was looking inside his brain. Did he see right? Did he realize that the brain of painters and any brain is really first detecting not only outline, but then lines, simple lines? Indeed, this experiment, done already many decades ago, found a relation between external events and brain events. A simple line stimulus in the visual field, here is portrayed with two eyes and the connection with the visual lines in the brain going to the cortex and recording single cortical cells, electrical recording, see what's the relation between seeing a, a, an oblique line and what happened to the neurons in the brain. Well, it looks like that the neurons of the visual cortex respond to single lines with different orientations, you see. Entire areas of the brain, of the cortex, uh, respond to horizontal line, oblique line, vertical line. So to see a visual stimulus with this polygon correspond to hit the cortex with a similar polygon activating cells that respond to single lines. In this case, oblique line here, horizontal line there, and so on and so forth. So the brain builds the outline of a stimulus by indeed creating an artificial activity which corresponds to the very painting of Mondrian and he simply painted lines. This is what the brain does when we see something. Yet there's another sense that we have of uh, what is there, a perception of relative intensity. Everybody will see this darker, the left uh, inner uh, square, than the one on the right. This is light, and there's little doubt. This is actually is a real perception. Is it a real phenomenon? 
Well, look at this. If you remove the surrounding square to this two squares look like different intensity of grays, they look exactly the same. They are exactly the same. So, the brain invents, creates this illusion of this darker than that one. But is this illusion something that happened in the real brain? When we say illusion simply is false. No, it's not false. It's a true response of a brain, because if you now go to see what the brain nerves cells in the cortex respond to this, they respond to this square with lower activity, these blips are actual potentials, than when the same square is surrounded by light. So this illusion has indeed a proper electrophysiological uh, change in the brain and specific neurons respond to this illusion in a real way. Another example, Mach bands of different uh, darkness of grey. Now, the visual perception of very intensity and increased contrast. We see what happens when we put next to each other. This Mach band put next to each other produce indeed a sense in the brain of uh, not of same values, but a sharp changes, which you can see here on the left of this darker than on the right, become lighter, then suddenly become darker, and then become lighter. Again, this illusion, we all share this, is this real? Is this something happening in the brain? Well, indeed. This is a stimulus between two different uh, uh, darkness. The perception is that the brain creates like a line in between, increases this uh, distinction between what is dark and what is light. We know this because recording from neurons from the retina with ganglion cells in the retina, some of them are called center ganglion cell surrounding cells in a patch of retina. You can see that when there is complete light or complete darkness, the neurons go simply blip, 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 blip. But when there's a sharp distinction passing through a particular part of this little patch of retina, the neurons fire like hell. So this means that they are really creating a, a, a sense of having a big distinction between the light and dark by inventing, creating an activity as if it were to be a very sharp distinction between the two, a very sharp line exaggerated. So the brain is really constructing our percept, perspect of having this increased separation of intensities. Painters already discovered this. Look, George Seurat in this white and the black has no lines at all. It simply got a change in intensity. And yet this creates a complete sense of outline, very strong. Uh, is due to this neural process generating contrast perception. This painter discovered this without knowing anything about the brain. That's why I'm saying that the painters really explore the way in which the brain works. This illusion, everyone has seen it, with some of the center circle looking white and the surrounding looking black, but you can never focus on them because it's indeed it's an illusion that again has the basis of connection within the retina, within the brain. So this illusion do have a very real uh, physical, physiological underground basis in the brain itself. So we cover as to where things are, location in space, what things are there by the shapes. Now, what about the colors? Indeed, color is another form of identifying what things are. Well, painters discovered this. Henry Matisse painted this red studio, gave an importance to the red, realizing that his brain was full of red. Pierre Mondrain, the famous Broadway Boogie Woogie, in 1942 for the three in the middle of the Second World War, painted this very famous painting, which is used now for visual perception, by the way, too. But anyway, this famous painting where the colors are all what is important. Even this, this uh, Barnett Newman painting lines and color, entirely based on the red, very original. Now, it's based on the fact that the brain is detected 
the color as an important aspect of visual experience. Indeed, working in the animal brain, even human brain, while recording from the visual cortex called V1, V2 and V3, it stands for visual, during view, viewing of a color stimulus, you can see a color stimulus, you can see that some neurons in the cortex respond to the red with a barrage of action potential, brrr, but not to green or to blue or to white, simply goes on the same way. So the specific neuron in the cortex recorded with microelectrodes respond just to the red. So there are, uh, this is an area in the cortex, the visual cortex, that respond indeed individually to the single colors of a mandrine or the single colors that we see in real life. Then, of course, the next thing is, who is there? Um, apes and uh, monkeys and apes and humans, we do have a specific part of our brain that deal with faces, something evolutionally very important. Of course, faces, I told you, were uh, achieved the maximum, if you like, representation in the, at the end of the Renaissance. Albert Durer is a good example of a self-portrait of a human face. Work later, uh, recently in the last decades, show that if you record the activities, this histogram shows the degree of activity when a monkey or a human, in this case a monkey, is shown this picture of a face made fundamentally of a circle, two eyes and a nose and a, and a mouth, and you can see there's a specific neuron in the impertemporal imper cortex uh, um, that respond to the faces, respond to this stimulus, respond to this one with a circle, two eyes and the mouth, but not if you don't have a mouth. The neuron is silent, or only have the mouth, silent. Or only have the eyes and the mouth, but not the outline of the face. Or if you only got the outline of the face, empty. But if you put again the outline of the face, two eyes and the mouth, it responds. If these are not sufficiently explicit, then it doesn't respond. So you can see there are some neurons that respond to the minimal idea of a face, the face, the two eyes and the mouth. A remarkable set of neurons that are, are important for recognition of faces in social life. Painters have already discovered that the color and the shape of a face is important. On the left you have actually uh, a painting of a face, you can recognize the face quite well. Close the eyes a little bit, you can see the ear, the nose, and the bit of the eye, the head. If it is light and red, it's very hard to do that. How subtle is the way in which the brain builds a perception of a face that requires some minimal detail, some minimal elements, but it needs them in order to recognize a face. So, this uh, work of, uh, by Sami Seki, uh, realize the original part of the visual brain, V1, V2, V3, and V4. There's an area in front of it that is actually recognizing objects in face recognition. So neurons here do recognize more than just simply spots and lines. This experiment, done also fairly recently, about 20 years ago, shows the activity of the brain measured in terms of time from the exposure to a stimulus, zero time, this milliseconds close to a half a second, and on the vertical we have the frequency at which the neurons are firing. And the neurons are firing, in this case, close to 40 hertz, very, very precisely, only soon after you expose the brain, your brain, to a face you can recognize here, a lady with the eye, the nose, and the, and the mouth. But if you put a similar picture below, which is nonsensical, it doesn't have a picture of a face, there's no such activity in your brain, less than half a second after the picture is shown, at this 40 hertz of synchrony, there's no synchrony. So this is telling us for the first time that there's a functional correlate of recognizing a specific perception, a specific idea of perception 
that is uh, expressed in the brain as a short burst of activity of neurons synchronized with each other close to 40 parts per second. And this is the, the closeness that we can go for the time being to represent the brain activity as it happens when we have a very specific experience. The brain, of course, looks and, uh, through the eyes and the eyes are moving. When we see a picture like this, people already about 30, 40 years ago managed to put a little camera attached to the eye that will follow in the movement of the eyes. You can see that the eye, the, 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 your vision, most people, go from one eye to the other eye, to the mouth, and all around. You see, remember the idea that there are specific neurons in the brain that respond to the two eyes, a mouth, and the outline of the face. Here is. That's what we are looking when we are looking at the face. We have an impression of seeing the entire face, but the eyes are really focusing only in a very specific way. So specific that each one of us will see and look in a different way the same picture. We know that uh, we do see the world from our own eyes by different movement of the eyes, which are different in all of us. Very interesting phenomenon. Well, going back to very traditional painting, we can see we have the ability of detecting a face, detecting, detecting colors, detecting shapes or forms, and something in space perspective. Projected into our own brain, this is where they happen. We have the space of uh, the, 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 is, is the where, and on the lower part, the ventral side of the brain, has the, 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 the what. We represent the face and objects, and the forms and the color are in different areas. So you can see we begin to map how the brain relates to what we see. And the painters have already explored a lot of this. Then the last one is what they are doing. The thing that we see, the texture of motion. Again, we have a, a in the visual field something that can move in on the left or on the right and record from the neurons in the cortex, visual cortex. Some neurons respond to a line and move to the right, but not to the left. This goes like hell, like a this simply go blip 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 blip, keep doing what was was doing. So there are specific neurons that describe very well by Sabir Seki that respond to a movement of a line in a particular direction. So these are detection movement sensors. And this indeed is in this part of the visual cortex number five. Detecting movement, neuroimaging of the human cortex, neuroimaging studies of a brain cerebral cortex show activity in this B5 area in response to moving stimuli. This B5 region damage in subject makes the subject unable to perceive movement. So some lesion proved the point. On the other hand, stimulating this area electrically gives the perception of motion altered in the person that has uh, this new experience. So you see, we begin to understand quite well the relation between what we see and what the brain does when we see something. With the painters having done a lot of this job. Now, visual images and perception of motion was already postulated uh, by John Ayton in 1826, postulated a system <coughs> of vision, that the vision comes in little images which are persistent in time. It was preceded by the astronomer Al Adzen in the 10th century, where he saw he thought of a rapid succession of images that could create illusion of movement. It was Michael Faraday in the early 1800s that described the phenomenon called the pi by Gestalt psychologists, a quick appearance of spots next to each other is interpreted as motion. So this really represents the way in which you can actually portray something moving. Of course, this was the beginning of movies. The Stamper's Troposcopy of Pantascope, shape number 10, in 1833. These are the things that you can rotate holding. In the scanning of this lit across the reflected images 
kept them from simply blurring together so that the user can see a rapid succession of images that appear to be like a single moving picture, this merging the images with each other. So this is the beginning of detecting motion as the brain does. We can reproduce by doing what the brain does. Again, here is 1893, one of the first, in a way, not movie, but it's called a paper, though a practice disc by my bridge. If you rotate this and look into a slit, it looks like a sequence of pictures that uh, you, your brain joined them, making you feel it, you're looking at something moving. The movies are indeed nothing but this push to a maximum degree. The cinematography was born with uh, Etienne Jules Murray, who was also a physiologist in science, and he applied this multiple lasers to take multiple pictures, one after another, and projecting them on a screen in a, in a fast sequence, gave indeed the cinematography, cinema means kinetic movement, graphic representation of movement. Painting, of course, did try to follow this, give the illusion of movement through shapes. This uh, Dan Cezo Café, uh, uh, created by the French artist and theorist Jean Metzinger, an oil painting that is not realistic, but it gives a sense of movement. <coughs> the famous Paul Klee, figures in red. This is a representation of movement simply in a painting. The famous Duchamp, nude descending a staircases. You can see definitely a woman descending the stairs. An abstract painting gives a sense of motion. The very famous Giacomo Balla, uh, the dynamism of a dog on the leash in the early 1900s. More recently, uh, well, Umberto Boccione also in Italy, the city rises, the idea that the big uh, changes in the vision of people arriving to a city. Even pictures, this in the center of Milan, slightly blurred to give a sense of motion. So this shows almost still pictures by artists that give a sense of motion. Indeed, again, Zamis Seki found indeed that this is a, the area of motion, and together with the other areas, we can conclude that visual images are constructed by different specialized areas of the brain working together. I end this part seven, painting beyond visual reality, by concluding that the major feature of the visual system extracts from the external world, where things are, location is space, what things are there, shapes and colors, who is there, identifying faces, what are they doing, by motion detection, and these are brought together, binding all of this part of, of the brain in a single uh, broad area of the brain that the people are still looking how this happened, as a single perception, a single perception, a single experience. Well, in a way, this leaves me with the idea that we can continue in the next talk about what happened indeed in the brain when we are seeing something. Cheer up. <laughs>